Welcome to High Ridge Church. Here at High Ridge, we are a family of churches, and our hope is to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. In the seat back in front of you, there are four cards. The card labeled New Here will give you more information about High Ridge Church and how you can get involved or join us in one of our groups. The communication card lets us know that you were here. We hope you leave High Ridge Church strengthened and encouraged. Even if this is not your first time here, the communication card is our way of starting a conversation. If you have any prayer requests, questions about ministries, or want to sign up for Pastor Jeff's awesome weekly encouragement, please fill out one of these cards and drop it in the offering containers or boxes by the exit doors. At the end of every service, there will be an opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you make this important decision today or have ever done this before, we highly encourage you to drop a response card in the boxes by the doors as you leave. We want to help you take your next step with Christ. You can always give online at highridgegram.com. If you prefer cash or check, the giving envelope is located in the seat back in front of you. Thank you so much for your generosity. We have a lot of things going on at High Ridge Church. You might hear something on the platform, in passing, or maybe you have no idea what's going on. The best way for you to get details you need for every event or ministry at our church is on highridgegram.com, or you can always connect with one of our One Team volunteers in the lobby. We encourage you to lean in with anticipation for what God is going to do this weekend in your life. Thank you for joining us at High Ridge Church. All right, we are so blessed this morning to continue our series on Ten Commandments. Uh, Pastor Zach's not here, but we have an awesome brother in the house this morning. Church, let's give it up for Pastor Tim Ingram from the Long High Ridge Longview. Yes, thank you so much for being here. Will you guys extend your hands and let's pray for our brother in Christ, please. Father God, we thank you so much for Pastor Tim's leadership, for his wisdom, and for the awesome word that you have placed on his heart to share with us this morning. I pray that each heart in this room would be fertile soil to receive your word this morning, God, and we lift him up to you that he would be a mighty vessel of you, Lord. It's in your name we pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Darby. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys are amazing. It feels so good to be back in Graham, Texas. My name is Tim in Graham. So I feel related to you already. <laughs> so good to be with you. Happy Father's Day for those of you that are fathers and grandfathers, spiritual fathers, uh, stepfathers. We appreciate you. Being a dad is hard work, and uh, we want to honor you this morning. There's a special gift that we're going to have for you later on, but I'm not going to spoil the surprise. Grab your Bibles if you would. Let's, uh, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18, then from there we're going to the book of Exodus chapter 20. We're going to continue on with the Ten Commandments series, kind of God's top ten, the things that are important to God. And uh, as we're doing that, I want to welcome in those that are listening in online, on podcasts, and also on the uh, Miracle of the Interwebs. So High Ridge family, let's give it up for those that are listening in and too lazy to come here in person. Come on. <laughs> and Pastor Zach, if you're watching, I'll be careful, I promise. So don't take me too seriously, I'm, uh, I'm Hispanic. And so uh, over here, to prove it, uh, this is my mom and dad, if you guys would make them feel welcome. Notice they don't stand up and, and uh, show you really who they are until they finish hearing my message. Also from, uh, from High Ridge Longview, which is my home church, I'm the senior pastor there at High Ridge Church in Longview, we have our youth pastor, Zach Vaught, and his wife, Taylor. <laughs> Next to them is Grace, who runs a lot of our first impressions. And of course, the most beautiful woman in this room, this is my wife, Tina. <laughs> and so it is good to, it's good to be here with you this morning. We've... Uh, We've seen God do so many powerful things at this campus, and it is exciting to not only see what God has done, but to believe God for an incredible future, not just for this church, but for this city. This city needs you. This city needs Jesus, and it's a wonderful day to be a part of such an awesome church and to be with you this morning. So as we're turning in our Bibles, I want to just continue on to, to pay honor to Pastor Zach. I think he's doing a great job. You guys enjoy Zach and Miranda? Great people. They're from Louisiana, but we don't hold it against them. They got to Texas as fast as they could. So uh, let's continue on with this Ten Commandments. We're going to move on to commandment number two. Pastor Zach did a great message uh, last week, giving you commandment number one, and now we get into the stuff that nobody wants to talk about, the hard messages, and that's why they bring me in. Let's find a way to make it less boring. So I promise you, over the next 25 minutes or so, we're trying to, try to make this as unboring as possible. We got a deal? Can we do that together? I won't put you to sleep if you won't fall asleep. But every once in a while, you got to just, just amen me. If you feel yourself falling asleep, just give me an amen, and we'll know that you were close, but didn't quite step over, you know? <laughs> so we're moving on to, to idols. 
talking about idols. Yay! Let's talk about idols. How does that apply to me at all? How does that help me with my boss, Pastor Tim? How does that help me in my marriage? How does that help me with our finances? What does the Ten Commandments have to do with me? And so let's, let's figure out how it applies to our life together. And so you have to remember, in the context of this story, what God is doing is God has just pulled the children of, Egypt, of Israel out of Egypt. And this is a pagan country full of many, many gods. And in this process, he's taken them through the desert, and he's about to lead them into Canaan, who has even more idols. So God just has a few years. Actually, it was supposed to be about two weeks, but because they couldn't quite get the lesson, it ends up being 40 years for them to learn how to get idols out of their life. And so as God leads them into Canaan, he's trying to tell them, don't be deceived. Just because they look like they're having a good time, they're a bunch of idol worshipers, and I don't want you to ever become like them. And the message still rings true for us. God is saying, if I'm to be the Lord of your life, I want you to understand that you can't look around at the rest of the world that seems to have a good time on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and be deceived by that. Just because people are saying that they're happy or having a good time or because they're successful in this doesn't necessarily mean that things are in order in their life. And I think in Christianity, it's sometimes it's easy to think, man, if I, if I wasn't you know, doing things ethically or morally, I would be farther ahead. And I know this to be true in business. I've had uh, many, many opportunities where I thought, man, if I wasn't a Christian, it'd be so much easier. These people would never know. You know, they didn't, they didn't realize that they overpaid me by $10,000. Do I really have to say something? Don't look at me like I'm the only person in here that's ever had a moment of questioning my morals and, and my Christianity. I'm thinking, God, you know, if you could just look that way for five minutes, I would have 10 grand in my pocket, and it'd be awesome. I'll tithe. I'll, I'll give you something. It'd be our secret, you know? But God is saying, look, 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 I want to get all this junk out of you before you walk into this next land. And then you're deceived by thinking that just because they have a lot of wealth, that they're better off than you. No, no, no. I want you to, to understand that a relationship with me is way more important than what perceives to be happiness. And so God has this period where he's trying to not just take them out of Egypt, but get the Egypt out of them. It's like you could take a Mexican out of the ghetto, but you have a hard time taking the ghetto out of this Mexican. And now that you know I'm Mexican, please don't leave. So uh, God has taken them out of one land, bringing them into the next. They're both full of idols. Um, and uh, probably the worst one is the god Molech. And what people would do for the god Molech is they would sacrifice their children in fire. And God warns them against this. And he's like, look, I know it seems awesome to think that they're, they have all these different gods that they can kind of worship the way that they want to instead of being restricted to just the way that I want it. But they're sacrificing their children in a fire. How can that be something that's holy? And we pick this up in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Look at verse 9. We're going to read through the next four or five verses here. And God speaks through Moses, and he speaks to them, and he says, When you come into the land, verse 9, which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out before you. He's saying, because they do this, I'm against them. That's the reason why you're inheriting their land, is because they're doing all these horrible things. I'm giving all the best of their stuff to you. But you need to understand that don't be deceived by thinking it's about you or it's about the way that they worship. So God goes on to say this in verse 13, you shall be blameless before me, the Lord your God. For these nations which you will drive out, they dispossess, listen to the soothsayers and diviners. But as for you, the Lord God has not appointed such for you. He's saying, that's not for you. That's not what I've appointed for you. Don't be tricked. Don't be deceived. Those are counterfeit gods. And God says this over and over and over to the children of Israel. Don't be tricked into believing something that's counterfeit. It's not real. And what do they do with it a few short years? They get tricked. They do the exact same, the exact same thing that God told them not to do. And it's easy for us to look at the Word of God and say, man, those guys were just dumb. Until we realize that all of us do that at some point. 
It may have started with your parents, but there's not a single person in this room that obeyed every single thing your parents told you to do. No, you didn't. One of the first words you ever learned was the word, no. <laughs> All of us have disobeyed. It's kind of just in our nature to question, to challenge, to push. To say, you know what? Dad's old. He doesn't know. He's like, no, he's old because he's lived a long time and seen people do it. He's trying to tell you it's a trick. It's a trap. Don't fall for it. It's counterfeit. I had a buddy of mine that was a, that was a roommate for a while and uh, he wasn't the sharpest knife in the, in the drawer, and I'll, I'll, I'm not going to mention his name because there are people here that know him, and I'm sorry. Uh, but his name, his name rhymes with Donnie. And uh, <laughs> Donnie one time was so excited, he called me. He's like, you would not believe I, I bought a new flat screen TV. And this was back in the day. I'm kind of dating myself. But flat screen TVs were all the rage. And uh, we really, really wanted a, a flat screen TV because it, they're flat. It's cool. And you may not remember if you're a millennial that TVs were not always flat. And so he comes home with this huge box of Sony 50-something inch, you know, television HD. We're like, oh, awesome. Where'd you get this from? He said, there was a guy in a white van parked out in front of the mall, and he was selling these flat screen TVs for 50 bucks. Can you believe how great of a price that is? I'm like, no, <laughs> no, 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 it's legit. Yeah, I'm sure it is. No, seriously. I tried to buy four of them. If you tried to buy four of them. And the guy wouldn't sell them to you? He said, no, he said, if I like this one, you know, that, that if I like this one, I could come back and buy more. But he wanted me to try this one out first. So he opens up the box and pulls out this flat screen TV that turns out to be an oven door. <laughs> an oven door. I was like, I didn't know that GE made flat screen TVs. He's like, uh -oh. he starts crying, realizes that he's gotten taken. He bought an oven door, thought it was a flat screen TV. And I said, do you realize that this guy that ripped you off Felt so bad for ripping you off that he didn't even want to sell you any more TVs because you're that stupid. <laughs> he bought an oven door for 50 bucks, thinking that it was a flat screen TV. And it's easy for me to laugh at him, but in, in, in some other cases, you change the situation around a little bit, and I've done the same thing. I've been told not to do something, and I end up doing it. I look at something thinking that it looks really, really good on paper. It turns out it's not quite as advertised, and so have you. And so when we see the children of Israel doing the exact same thing, parts of us have to realize, wait, you know, I might have done the exact same thing. That might be me. So God is saying, don't be tricked. I've not appointed that for you. That's not for you. It's a trap. It's a trick. Don't believe it. Don't fall into that. So what God has appointed for us is a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God is saying, I've got something so much better for you, and his name is Jesus. Don't be deceived into worshiping the other gods. Don't be deceived in falling into the same trap. Fall in love with Jesus. God wants to give us something that's real, something that's pure, something that's right. And my hope for us today as we're reading God's word is that uh, now that God has, has pulled you out of Egypt, he can start pulling some of the Egypt out of you. And for some of us, I think we get into this mindset of thinking that all I've got to do is get saved. And now that I have my fire insurance, everything is good between me and the big man upstairs. But let me just tell you this, that's the beginning. It's the beginning of a beautiful relationship with Jesus where you allow him to begin to purify you of things that you might not even have realized that were there. And our responsibility is to simply trust him and to let him do it. Let him do it. So I wonder, what are those things to you? What are the idols to you? What are the things that God is saying, don't be tricked, don't be deceived? Because each of us have them. We may not admit them. We may not talk about them. We may keep those private. Maybe you're, the thing that you struggle with is known. Everybody knows it. But you still have it regardless. There are parts of our lives that we would like to say, God, you can have this, and you can have that, and you can have this, but this over here, I like this. And all the while, God is saying, I, 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 won't, I don't want to just be Lord of some things. I want, to, I want to be Lord of all. All of it. What are those things to you? And I'm not here to just step on your toes or to make you feel bad. I'm simply saying, let's look at the Word of God. Let's look at God's top ten list and say, is there anything that relates to my life? Is there any chance for me to say, okay, God, 
I didn't realize that this was there, but if this is a problem between me and you, I choose you. I choose you. Because I believe that what God has for me is better than what I'm holding on to. For some of us, it's fear. For some of us, it's a past. For some of us, it's a habit. It's an attitude. It's a mindset. But each of us has our thing. I'm not perfect, and neither are you. Now, my wife is. But other than that, the list is very short. As we're looking at the Word of God, I think it's, it's, it, it, it's just an amazing thing that God shows us how to not be deceived by looking at Jesus. Understanding that a personal relationship with Jesus, a really close relationship with Him, is what keeps us from falling into the same traps that everybody else falls into. So think about this. The, the Ten Commandments itself are broken up into two parts. Uh, the first five deal with how we relate to God. It's about our worship. The second half deals with how we relate to other people. So when you think about it, in terms of direction, the first half is all vertical. And the second half is all horizontal. Showing us that even God, through his law, is pointing the way to the cross. Pointing the way towards Jesus. And I love that about him. He's saying, look, through all of these rules and regulations, if you can see the cross, you can see my hope for you. And here's the thing about the law. When we talk about the law and how difficult it was for people, it didn't just start with 10 commandments. It ends up being over 600. It gets out of control. It becomes religion. And it becomes gross and nasty. It becomes death. But God never meant for it to become that. See, the law is like a mirror. And it just shows us how dirty our face is. But you can't clean your face with a mirror. It just reflects how dirty we are. And if we only see how dirty and how messed up we are, we miss the point. And the point is the cross. The point is Jesus. Look on in verse 15, and I'll, I'll prove this to you. After God talks to them about not sacrificing their children and not falling into, in, into uh, this trap of falling after idols, look at verse 15. It says, the Lord will God, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren, him you shall hear. One of the most interesting things about that scripture is the word prophet has a capital P. Him you shall hear has a capital H. I didn't put that in there. God himself did. Because he's speaking not about just some prophet and not just about some messenger. He's speaking about Jesus. Don't fall into the same trap he's saying that everyone else falls into. Don't fall in love with their gods. Fall in love with Jesus. Everything that God does points towards a personal relationship with Jesus for us. This is how we stay free from the traps and the counterfeit things of the world. This is how we keep from buying spiritual oven doors. It's about Jesus. It's about your walk with him. And the deeper and the deeper that you fall in love with Jesus, the less and less you're going to be deceived by things that just aren't quite as good. It's amazing the things that people will settle for. How's your walk with Jesus today? How's your love affair with him? What's your love level look like when you're honoring your true father? So I think, it's, uh, I think it's always neat when God continues to say, you shall not, you will not, you cannot, uh, because it always reminds me of my parents. You know? And what he's doing here is not saying, you shall not, you will not, you cannot, uh, because he doesn't want you to have a good time. I think that's where a lot of people have this mindset. Well, God is just nothing but rules and regulations because he doesn't want me to have a good time. Nothing could be further from the truth. He wants you to have life and life more abundantly. But people fall away from God all the time because they assume that God is just rules and doesn't want them to have any fun. But he's more like a loving parent saying, look, you're not going to play in the street. But the street's where all the fun is at. No, that's where death is at. You don't understand. I can catch those cars, mom. No, you can't. You're going to catch a bumper. And so God is, God is not saying, I don't want you to have a good time. He's saying, I don't want you to die. I don't want you to, to, to fall into this trap and to be deceived and to get your life messed up. And so this is where we come to commandment number two, Exodus 20, verses three. God is very clear in his word, and he says this, you shall have 
no other gods before me. Verse 4, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water underneath the earth. You shall not. He says, you shall not bow down to them, you shall not serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. That's an interesting scripture. We don't see that very much in, in God's word, but I just want to pause there for a moment for us to just take in what that, what that might mean to us. When God says, I'm jealous for you. I don't want you to fall in love with any other thing. I don't want you to worship anything else. That belongs to me. I'm jealous for you. Have you ever thought about God being jealous for you and for your affection? It kind of puts a new light on things in our relationship with God. He's jealous for me. God says, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon their children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. God says, I want you to love me, and I want to bless you in return. Don't fall in love with anything else. So the Canaanites, these group of people, worshipped more idols than anyone else on the face of the planet. And so God is trying to prepare them, saying, look, you're gonna, you think you've seen idol worship? You just wait. Because these people really know how to worship some idols. And so the nation of Israel, the small nation, was the only nation that did not worship any image of their God. That's what made them unique. They had no carved images. And so when they finally walk into the land of Canaan, God had spoken to them and said, look, you're going to see a bunch of idol worship. Don't fall for it. It's a trap. And so the children of Israel, are, they're explaining to the Canaanites why they don't carry around little gods and why they don't have the Asherah poles. And they said, well, because we worship Yahweh. This is our God. And they're like, the Canaanites respond, oh, we get that. That's your national God. Yeah, we have a God that's like that. We name him El. That's your national God. But what you guys are missing is a family God and a personal God. See, there's, there's three different levels of gods. And we understand that you have this national God thing worked out, but you're missing the, the, there's a great side of this. And through this little bit of deception, making them think that they haven't quite gotten the full experience of idol worship, it makes the Israelites walk right into deception. Oh, well, yeah, that's great, but what you don't understand is this, and begins to add to. I get that. You have a national God. We do too. But what about your family God? What about your personal God? Because you, you need a personal God. And God was trying to tell them the whole time, no, 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 no. I'm your personal God. It's about me. And God is still screaming at his people that he wants a personal relationship with them. Don't be deceived by that. And so the Israelites walked into the exact same trap looking at the Asherah poles and the Baals, and we see that through the, through the entire Old Testament, they have this struggle between Asherah and Baal, which are family gods and personal gods. Now, they will still honor God in their own way, but he doesn't have authority over their families over, or over themselves. And this is the deception, the exact same thing that God told them not to do. I love Colossians 1.18 that says, Jesus, Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God. Everything that God does wants to point us towards a personal relationship with Jesus. And he's saying through that, let that be a reflection of your worship towards me. Let everything that you do point back to Jesus. And this is where we learn how to stay free from idol, idol worship. It's where we look at every area of our life, our business, our marriage, our finances, the way that we raise our children, and ask ourselves a simple question, does this bring glory to God? Can Jesus be glorified through this? And that's a great filter to put up on every area of our lives. Can Jesus be glorified through this? I think it's interesting that people will win, win some award, like the, you know, the gangster rap album of the year, and be like, I just want to thank my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for giving me these amazing words to write down that offended so many. You're like, are you serious? You use the F word more than any person on the planet, and you want to thank your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, just trying to give glory to God. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't know if that works that way, but I appreciate your heart, you know? 
Two points for trying has an a E for effort. <laughs> but I wonder what does your life look like if all of a sudden it wasn't just to do life, but to bring glory to God. If everything about us was to bring glory to God, how would that change some things? If you're a businessman, if you're a single mom, if you're a divorced dad, if you're a farmer, if you're working in oil and, in oil and gas, what if every day was built around, God, how can I bring glory to you today? How can my walk with you bring you the most glory? How would that change the way that you operate, the way that you speak, the way that you handle your marriage? How would that change? See, I think we have those same issues today that the Canaanites have. We have a, we have a national God. And his name isn't Jesus, his name is money. Capitalism. And it's really difficult for us not as, as Americans to not bow down to the God of money because it runs everything that we see. Money, 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 money. It's infiltrated the church, made so many people turn away from God. As soon as you get money involved in church and people freak out. Well, they took up an offering at that church. Oh, my God, I can't believe it. Well, it costs money to keep the lights on. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm not asking for a $43 million jet. I want to apologize right now to Jesse Duplantis. I uh, didn't mean that. <laughs> if you want to give me one of your jets as a peace offering, I will accept on Jesus' behalf. <laughs> we have, I'm sorry. We, we have other idols that we deal with. We have a family idol. That's Pride. People ask you, how's your family? We went to a family reunion this weekend. Everybody's breaking out pictures of their kids and talking about how awesome they are. It's like, you know, I know your kids. There's four of them meth addicts. And uh, I know you're really proud of them, but let's be honest. You only told us the good things, not the third stint in rehab. And I'm appreciating the fact that they're trying, but life is not all about this highlight reel, only showing people the good. There's, there's problems in all of our families. No, there's no family that's perfect. But we bow down to this God of pride and kind of make it our family God. You, you ever seen that in your own family? We also have some, some personal idols, and those are different from person to person. But for, for you, Dad, maybe it's your boat. <laughs> you know, the water is right on Sunday morning. It's amazing how the water is perfect on Sunday mornings and Sunday mornings alone. You're like, I'm sorry, God, but I feel way closer to you out here where the bass are biting than I do in that church. <laughs> Maybe your money. Maybe your favorite celebrity. I had an uncle of mine that was stationed in Germany, and he'd been there for quite a while and was missing his family, and two of his sisters wanted to come see him, and um, he had made the mistake of telling them that he was serving in the same company as Elvis Presley. And so when his sisters got off the plane, the first thing they asked was not, where's my brother, but where's Elvis? He's like, I never felt so used in my entire life. Like, okay, I'm your brother. Thanks. I haven't seen you in three years. He's over there, you know? I wonder, what is it to you? What are the things that keep God from being the Lord of all? Let's get practical with this. I want to give you three quick practical points before we end today, give you a way that you can apply this to kind of, uh, to, to your own life. How do we take this, uh, the second commandment and really bring it home to something that can, that can affect our lives tomorrow. And the first thing I want to share with you is how, we, how do we stay free from, from idol worship is to, number one, have amazing quiet times. Have amazing quiet times. If you're a note taker, write that down. Have amazing quiet times. Your time spent with God should be quality time, not just the quantity of time. It doesn't have to be hours and hours and hours, though if you're that kind of person, that's awesome. And one of those hours, pray for me. In all honesty, we don't have that kind of time, but let your time with God be the best of your time. Have amazing quiet times. Don't get up from your knees until you, hear, until you heard from God, until you felt His presence. Turn on some worship and sincerely and honestly 
Press into his presence. Have an amazing quiet time. If you stay close to God, you don't have to worry about falling in love with things that are counterfeit. Get close to him. Have an amazing quiet time. Make it a priority in your life. Don't go long without spending time with God. Stay close to him. Stay close. Everything that God is doing is pointing his way towards a personal relationship with Jesus. Take full advantage of that. Have amazing quiet times with God. Develop that relationship with Him. Number two, how to stay free from idol worship is to honor God first. I'm not just saying to honor God. I'm saying honor Him first. This is a timeless principle told to us by the Creator of heaven and earth over and over that he wants to be honored with the first fruits of what we have. That might be your money, your possessions, your time, your talent. You know, the very first thing I do now that I've been walking with God for a couple of decades now, it's been a long time, but it's just become part of who I am that I wake up and the first thing out of my mouth is, good morning, Lord. I'm still clearing the sleep away from my eye. I still don't even know if, what year it is. But I'm automatically saying, good morning, Lord. I love you, Lord. I start the first of every single day by habit, by speaking to him. And I realize that if I honor God first, everything else that comes is a distant second. No matter what my day may hold, it started out in the presence of God. Honor God first. I've learned that I do my tithe the moment that my direct deposit hits my account. I honor him first. It doesn't matter whatever's left. I honor God with the first. It's the first. And there's a principle there that I hope that you can catch today. Honoring God with the best of what I have first. We honor God on the front end. I don't wait to see what I have left over and decide to give God whatever I have left over. That's not honoring. That's what you do for someone that's begging. God doesn't have to beg. I hope that you can recognize the blessing in the hand of God upon, upon each and every part of our lives. Has God blessed you? Take a deep breath. <laughs> That's a gift from God. If you don't have anything else to be thankful for, take a breath. And it puts things into perspective. That breath was a gift from God. I've at least got the next breath to be thankful for. I've learned how to honor God first. The last one is this. If you're a note taker, go ahead and write this down. And that is to submit what you have. Submit what you have. Scripture tells us this over and over and over again. To give God what you have. Let him be Lord of all. Maybe as I was speaking today, there's some things that popped into your mind. And you're thinking, you know what, that... That might be an idol in my life. That might be something that God has been dealing with me, and I just, I'm kind of afraid to admit it. But God wants me to, to lay this down. Well, that tends to be a theme that runs through the Bible of God asking people to take a step of faith, to walk away from some things that just don't belong. And I'm going to give you a chance to do that right now. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me all across this place? We're just about finished this morning. But I want to give you a chance to respond to the Holy Spirit. And I want to ask you to pray a simple prayer right where you're at. Every single person in this room, the prayer is simply this. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Come on, pray with me, friends. Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? Is there any part of my life that does not line up with the Word of God? Are there attitudes that I've had? The way that I've been speaking to people? My anger? Is it a lust issue? Things that I've been looking at? Things that I've been allowing into my life and into my mind and into my marriage? Young man, that's not from God. Young woman, that's not God's plan for you. There's something better. Let Him be Lord of all. I'm not here to make you feel bad. I'm here to give you an opportunity to get free. Get free. Maybe you've had a hard time honoring God with your finances. Honoring God with the first. 
Let me just tell you this. As a brother, as a sister, please hear me. You would rather have 90% blessed than 100% cursed. There's one scripture in the Bible where God says, test me. And that's what it has to do with your honoring God with your money. I'm not here because I need your money this morning. I'm not asking for a dime. I don't need anything from you. I'm here to give you a timeless principle that will absolutely bless your life in an incredible way. Please hear me. Let the timeless principles of God's word keep you from being cheated out of your best life. Honor God. Submit to him. Let him have it, whatever that may be. Let him have it. With every head bowed and every eye closed, how many of us would say, by the simple lifting of our hand, Pastor, if I'm going to be really honest with you, there are some areas of my life that I've probably been holding on to, probably shouldn't have, and the Holy Spirit's kind of dealing with me. Friend, I'm not trying to embarrass you in any way. It's not what I want. Let me just see your hand. Is the Holy Spirit dealing with your heart? Let me just see your hand all over this place. Wow. Wow. You are not alone. There are many, 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 many people this morning saying, you know what? I'm going to be honest. I don't have it all worked out yet. I don't have it all figured out, but I'm willing to let God be God. Friend, he wants to be Lord of all. Take a step of faith. Give it to him in prayer. Let him have it. 